Okay, let's get started. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Healthcare for Child Care Outreach and Engagement Grant Program application process. We welcome your participation and we thank you for joining us this morning. Let's start off by introducing ourselves so we know who we're talking to. I am Linda Wharton Boyd, the Chief Communication Officer and External Affairs Director for the DC Health Benefit Exchange Authority. I push it over to you, Lori. Gotta unmute, unmute yourself. Good morning, I'm Lori Wilkerson. I'm Assistant General Counsel here at um, the Health Benefit Exchange Authority. And I will be um, also acting as a director of the Healthcare for Child Care Grant Program. Thank you. Over to you, Jenna. Hi, I am Jen Beeson. I am the Director of Marketplace Innovation, Policy, and Operations for HBX, and um, my team has been helping to implement the Healthcare for Child Care program since the beginning. Pass it over to Brian. Good morning. Brian Flowers. I'm the General Counsel here at the DC HBX. I'll be involved in the general uh, overview of the program and um, that's about it. Thanks. Thank you, Antonio. Oh, goodness. Thank you, Linda. Uh, <laughs> it's unexpected. <laughs> uh, I am the Director of Business Development for uh, uh, for DC HealthLink, and uh, uh, together with Jen, been involved in uh, healthcare for child care from the beginning. I look forward to, uh, to continuing uh, the work that we're doing. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning. I'm Jonathan Willingham. I'm at HBX and uh, help with the Healthcare for Child Care program as well. Great. Thank you. LaDon, Cynthia, and Saia. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed the prompt. <laughs> That's okay. Just who we are. I'm LaDon Love, the Executive Director of Spaces in Action. Thank you. Cynthia? Cynthia, you with us? Yes, I'm here. Sorry about that. I'm still in full-fledged classroom. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, I'm Cynthia Davis. I am the executive director of DC Family Child Care Association. Thank you. And good morning. I'm Sia Barbara Kamara. I'm the chief strategy officer for the DC Early Learning Collaborative. Great. Lindsay and Teresa. Okay, I got it, Teresa. You can't talk. Okay, no problem. Uh, Jeffrey and Kathy. Jeffrey can't talk, and Lindsay is hopping on for Jeff. I'm reading the chat for you, Lindsay. Yeah, great. I'm trying to get there. Okay, I'll go since until they get that all sorted out. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kathy Hallowell Meikle, the Executive Director at the District of Columbia Association for the Education of Young Children, also known as DCAUIC. Great, thank you, Kathy. She's also thank the Director you. of our HC for CC Advisory Council. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey, I think you you having problems as well, right? Okay, well, let's get started. I think Lindsay. Is that right? She's having a problem. You on, Lindsay? Oh, she's having a problem. They're having a problem. They put it in the chat. No problem. Just in, just put, place your name and your contact information in the chat, and we will have it as your attendance at this meeting. Thank you again for joining us, and I'm going to turn this over for a conference overview by Bryant Flowers, followed by Jen Beeson to give us an overview of HC for CC and our grant program. Over to you, Bryant. Morning. So we're here today just to provide you with uh, general background on the program and to go through the various parts of the RFA and to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, hopefully, we have everyone here that that you that you would that you need as a resource and um, shouldn't shouldn't be very long, but it just depends on how many questions that you have. Great, thank you. So this is an opportunity for qualified nonprofit organizations to learn more about the grant program and the application process. 
Uh, you will get an overview of Healthcare for Child Care grant program. You'll get outline of the grant goals, expectation requirements, and bu budget stimulate, uh, stipulations. And we want to ensure that potential applicants understand the important deadlines, qualification, and evaluation criteria. And with all of this, it provides you with a platform to ask us any questions that you may have. Thank you. Jen. You would think three years after we went into lockdown, I would know how to unmute myself. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, I'm just gonna give an overview about healthcare for child care. I know that many of you uh, already understand the basics about the program, although maybe not all of you. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. We can certainly get more detailed in your questions, but let me just talk briefly about healthcare for child care. Um, you'll hear me sometimes use the word DC Health Link and HBX interchangeably. The DC Health Benefit Exchange Authority is the name of our agency. DC Health Link is the platform where people go to buy health insurance. So DC Health Link is um, probably a little bit easier for people to get their, their minds around. So the reason I'm saying that is DC Health Link partnered with ASI the agency that licenses childcare facilities in DC to come up with more affordable healthcare options for childcare employees. Um, we started working on this just last summer and our goal was to get something up and running by January of 2023. Um, and so what we did was we uh, provided we, we created a program that could help both employers and employees of OSI licensed centers and homes. So the opportunity to get coverage comes in through two separate doorways. The first doorway is in our individual and family marketplace. And this is available for district residents and their families, like their spouse and their children. And through our individual and family marketplace, we have an offer of coverage where they could get a plan for $0 premiums. And there's a choice of three different plans they could get. Um, one is a Care First HMO plan. One is a Care First PPO plan. And the other is a Kaiser Permanente, which as you know, has like an HMO-like model. And so if you're a district resident, um, this, is, uh, this is available to you regardless of what action your employer takes and your premiums would be $0. The plan is a, we call it a silver standard plan, which means you get a lot of services um, before you have to hit the deductible. There is another door that I talked about. And the other door is for employer-sponsored insurance. Employers can provide health insurance for non-district employees by setting up, oh, there's an echo. Let me see, is that on my end? Can you mute everybody, uh, Alan? Mute everybody except Jen. <laughs> Yeah, and you, you go on mute too, Linda. Okay, there we go. This is better. Thank you. Um, so non-district residents can get covered by offering employer-sponsored insurance through our small business marketplace. And through the small business marketplace, we would provide a discount for coverage um, the discount could apply for both, um, applies to the employee, but sometimes depending on what the employer is offering, the employer would also see a discount. Um, in the small business marketplace, we do not have a discount for dependents. So the discount is just for the employee, not for the, not for the dependents. Um, and the size of the discount is based on the lowest cost standard silver plan. So that's a discount of about $277 for a 30-year-old. That discount would go up 
as the age of the employee goes up, but of course the cost of the care would also go up. There is a way to set up this offer of coverage so that neither the employee nor the employer owes any amount of money, or you can set up a more generous benefit package in which the employer contributes and the employee does not, or the costs are shared. There's lots of different ways to set this marketplace up. Um, let's see, what's the next slide, Alan? This just talks a little bit more about what I was saying. The What this benefit package looks like can be um, dependent on what the employer decides to offer. Um, the employer can decide what level of coverage to offer, silver, gold, or platinum. And that speaks to what level of deductibles the plan would have. The employer would decide how much they wanted to contribute to the cost of the care. They could put the cost entirely on their employees. They could split it 50-50, or they could pick up all of it, or anything in between. Um, the last thing I'll say, and I, I didn't do a slide for this, but I know that many of you on this call know this. Some of our child care employers in the district were already offering health insurance coverage to their employees. And so we also created a continuing coverage option for those employers who already offered coverage, they could continue offering that coverage or something similar on DC HealthLink and get that discount. So that discount we were talking about, that $277 for a 30 year old, that would apply. And that was important for us to do as well, based on feedback for some of the from some of the people on this call, because um, they did not want to put their district residents in a different plan than their non-district residents. So for them, we have a continuing coverage option. We'll work one-on-one -on -one with employers and help them find the plan that works for them. Let me talk a little bit. That's a you know, I did it really fast. It can be complex. I'm happy to spend a little more time talking about the ins and outs of the program. But let me talk a little bit about what we've done so far in terms of reaching out to employers and getting them enrolled. So we have, um, we, you know, started putting this in place last summer and scurried around, uh, made a lot of phone calls, sent a lot of emails, um, did in-person visits. We are pleased with our progress so far. Um, we have about 80 employers who are participating. More than half of the employers who have come on are um, new to offering coverage. They did not offer a health benefit before. So that's something we're enormously proud of. However, however, um, I think there is a limit to what DC HealthLink alone can do. We are not necessarily well known in the child care community. Health insurance is a complex business. It's not the most pleasant task. It's right up there with, you know, finishing your taxes. <laughs> so we need assistance. What we have done so far is we've done a lot of emails. Many of you probably get multiple emails from us. Um, forgive me for that, but even though we email a lot, it actually does generate some interest. We do phone calls. We have had our contact center make outbound calls. We've had our assister community. Those are people who help enroll people in health insurance. They do outbound phone calls. And my team does outbound phone calls to directors of facilities. We have made in-person visits dozens and dozens and dozens of in-person visits, driving around, knocking on doors, trying to meet with facility directors, showing up, dropping off um, you know, pamphlets when we can. And all of these efforts are all around trying to get folks to set up a meeting with us so that we can get them signed up. Um, unfortunately, this isn't one of those things where you just go onto a page and hit click, yes, I want, and then you're done, um, particularly particularly if you're an employer and you want to offer a benefit package to your employees, you, you know, you're going to have a lot of questions. We have to sit down with you and set up an account um, so that you are ready to go. 
Um, go to the next slide, Alan. So in addition to those efforts, we have also worked with a lot of folks on this call and others. Um, we've asked ASI to send emails on our behalf. We've joined them in coalition calls that they've had. Um, we have worked with our broker community, our insurance broker community. Many of the employers who buy insurance through DC HealthLink use, use brokers. Um, many of the childcare facilities that already offer insurance use a broker. So we've been working on educating them as well. We've asked to show up on coalition calls so we can talk about the program. And we set up an advisory council to help advise us on how we can improve our outreach and get deeper into the community. So with all of that said, um, we know that our, as I said, our reach alone is limited. Um, we need to engage trusted voices uh, in the community. So Alan, if you can go to the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we decided to set up an outreach and engagement partnership grant program. We know that we need trusted voices to deliver the message about healthcare for childcare. We need to build the uh, health literacy and health insurance literacy among the community. On this call, I threw out a bunch of terms that people may be a little bit unclear about, right? Like I was talking about deductibles, um, you know, that, that, that's not an easy concept to get your, your head around. Um, and then we are also setting up the grant program because we want your help in targeting populations, targeting underserved communities, where our reach, again, is more limited. So that's what the very basics about the program, what we've been doing in terms of outreach and engagement, and what we hope the grant program will do or extend in terms of our outreach and engagement. Thank you, Jen. Thank you so much for that overview. Let's jump into the nitty gritty of this and that's the application process. Lori, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. So what we're gonna do first, we're gonna go over um, just a general overview of the solicitation, and then I'm gonna give you guys some information about the length of the award, um, and then the requirements, or more generally, what the duties of the um, programs that are gonna receive these grants are gonna be. Then we're gonna discuss the different grant tier levels because there are gonna be three of those. Um, then we're going to talk about the eligibility requirements, the required documentation. We're going to go through some key dates. And then we're going to talk about how to apply um, because we're going to uh, have an online application for this. Okay, so just as a brief overview, we're seeking applicants from nonprofit entities to serve as what we're going to call outreach and engagement partners. So you're going to partner with us to do the healthcare for child care outreach. There has already been some grant funding approved for fiscal year 2023 as well as 2024. So it's going to be 160,000 have been approved for 2023 and 480,000 approved for 2024. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So the length of this award, it's it, because we're crossing over um, fiscal years and we wanna ensure that we can have a process where applicants are not required to apply again for this grant in 16 months, in six months, excuse me. This grant award is gonna start on June 1st and it's not going to end until September 30th of 2024. And then at the ending of that period, there's going to be four option years um, that are going to take us out to, I believe, 2028. But that's going to be based upon um, available funding, and it's going to be um, approved on an annual basis by our board. So these are some of the basic duties um, and expectations that we have for the overall grant program um, of the grantees. These are not all going to apply to each of the categories that we're going to discuss later, but they are the overarching, um, what we expect to see from the grantee program um, and as a whole. So first we're going to um, be expecting that the grantees are gonna be utilizing their trusted voices in the community to engage with um, 
the Aussie licensed child care facilities. Um, we're going to have in our one of our grant tiers, they're going to be what we're you know, on the ground outreach partners, and they're going to be conducting on-site visits. They're going to do virtual um, meetings. They're going to do town hall meetings. They're going to host events, um, and they're going to connect overall with healthcare for child care staff um, to encourage and um, facilitate enrollment. There is going to be um, some organizations will actually act as a conduit to develop subject matter competency around the healthcare for child care program, um, as well as health literacy in general. So just being able to uh, develop the program's knowledge so that they can then go out and answer questions about the healthcare care programs um, and promote on a deeper level what it is that healthcare for child care offers and the value that it can bring to an organization. And then we're going to build literacy around private health care insurance um, and help and employee sponsored health care insurance as well that Jen kind of touched on earlier. The programs are going to de develop partnerships with the DC Health Link. Um, also, we're going to be providing training. There are going to be entities that are going to engage in the train the trainer program, which is going to um, deepen your understanding of the healthcare landscape. Um, then organizations are going to be co-branding their, whatever they already, um, their existing communication channels and co-branding it with the healthcare for child care information. And then organizations are going to come up with exciting and engaging strategies to um, reach out in a culturally and linguistically appropriate way. Um, to reach these applicants or reach the employees of the healthcare of the OSI licensed facilities. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the different tier levels. And that's what I was addressing earlier, that not every organization that applies is going to do all of those duties that we just discussed. So there are going to be three grant tier levels. There's going to be tier one, tier two, and tier three. So a tier one applicant it's going to um, provide online digital outreach. So essentially, you will be using your existing um, your existing network and your existing modalities of communication with your population, and you're going to essentially be branding healthcare for childcare along with your own information, and then you're going to do a warm handoff. So if there's um, you receive a response from an interested person or interested facility, you're going to do a warm handoff either to one of the organizations um, that can provide more information or to one of the assister organizations. You're going to hand them off to a um, customer service representative through uh, HBX. Then we have the um, tier two grants, and that's going to be our digital and grassroots outreach. So with that, you're going to be sort of our foot soldiers, our on the ground, um, everyday working uh, entity that's going to actually do literature drops. You're going to participate in conferences. You're going to go to meetings. You're going to go out to the facilities and you're going to be um, giving this information to encourage enrollment. You're not going to actually be enrolling individuals in health plans, but you're going to be strongly encouraging enrollment, um, educating about the availability of the program and what value it can um, add. And then there are going to be um, tier three grants. And with those, those are going to be the entities that are going to do everything that I've described for grant tier one, everything that I've described for grant tier two. And then in addition, in addition you're going to really gain a deeper understanding um, of health insurance literacy. So then you can answer questions on a much deeper level about the availability of, um, of services and things like that. So that when you hand off to the um, person that's going to actually assist with enrollment, they would have a more full understanding and you can really um, kind of drive home the value add proposition of healthcare for childcare. So eligibility requirements, 
In order to be eligible to receive grant funding, you must be a nonprofit organization licensed and operating in the District of Columbia. You must already have an established relationship and network with and experience working with the Aussie licensed child development facilities. And you must be available to participate in the HBX provided training um, and to uh, distribute the HBX resources. So along with the dot with the application that's going to be an online web form, there's going to be some required documentation. Um, that required documentation is listed here. And this is pretty much in alignment with um, other grants that um, your organization may have applied for in the past. So you're going to need the most recent audited financial statement and auditor's report, your DC business license. Um, you're going to provide a disclosure of any indictments, charges, convictions, or legal proceedings against your organization. Um, you're going to provide disclosures of any insurance that your organization holds. The in the RFA, there are um, going to be attachments, and so there's going to be a, a statement of, excuse me, certification. You're going to sign that statement of certification. There's a conflict of interest attestation. You're going to make sure you sign that and upload it. There's a, there, you're going to be required to provide to us a certificate of clean hands and then a copy of your current year's fiscal um, operating budget. So here are some key dates. Um, the last date, so following this um, conference, you are going to have the opportunity to submit any follow-up questions. You can ask questions at the end of this, but if you do not uh, currently have the question or if you're looking through the RFA over the next day or two and you realize you have an additional question, you can submit those questions to um, our HBX email account. I think we provide that in the next slide. Um, to the grants email account, but the last day to submit those questions is going to be Friday, March 24th. And then we will post the responses to those questions on Tuesday, March 28th on our website. And then our final application submission date is going to be April 13th, 2023. And the notification of funding is going to be posted on the DCHBX website on May 11th, 2023. Okay, so this is the website that we um, have developed for um, programs to go to access the RFA as well as to um, apply for the grant funding. Alan, can you click on this link? I can share my screen to do this. I've had trouble in the past with sharing, but I can see if I'm able to share this. That's my screen. Alan, can you make her co-host so she can share? It's pulled up, uh, Lori. Can you make it a little bigger? Are you able to see this? It's kind of tiny, but we can see some of it. Yeah. Okay, sure. So this is the link that you're going to follow to um, gain access to both the RFA as well as the application. So if you see here, it's going to go through what I just discussed. Um, these are the different grant tier uh, classifications. It's going to give you a background regarding the length of the award. And then right here is where you're going to access the RFA. So if you click here, um, the actual RFA will pop up and it will 
give you all the information that you need to apply. It will give you um, all the information that I just discussed about the requirements, um, as well as a wealth of other information that you'll need in the process of um, applying and determining, you know, the evaluation factors and things like that. When you're ready and after you've reviewed the RFA, you're going to submit your application. There is an online process for submitting the application. These links are not live at the this moment. They should be live by the time we're done with this conference. So you would click on either grant tier one if you desire to apply for that tier. You would click on grant tier two if that's what your desire is, or you would click on grant tier three. When you click on these grant tier um, applications, an online web form will populate to your screen and you will put your information directly into that web form. Once you are done, you will click submit. You'll notice that you do not upload any documentation to these web forms because what is going to happen is that when you submit, you'll provide an email address. When you provide that email address, it um, I will send you within a day of you submitting your online application a link to a platform or application that's hosted um, by um, DC government called Box, and you will submit all of your supporting documentation. And there will be a list that is provided um, both on the application and when you press submit, there's going to be a, a, a pop up that says, Thank you for your submission. And then it's going to say, Please provide the following documentation. And all supporting documentation must be submitted by this deadline. So April 13th at 5 p.m. So obviously, if you wait until April 13th to do the electronic application, you're not going to be able to upload your document, your supporting documentation that same day because it takes a day for me to make your box, send it to you. Um, so we can have this done in a timely fashion. So all, all supporting documentation needs to be uploaded by this deadline. Um, and I will provide you a secure link so that you can upload that documentation directly into the box account. And also on this web page, there are some important um, deadline dates for um, submission of your application notification and just more information about the total uh, availability with the four option years. And now um, I'm going to, I guess, stop sharing and if Alan can take back over. Okay, thank you so much, Lori. Listen, that was a lot of information. So let's open up for a question. If you have a question, you can place it in the chat or hit your raise the hand and I'll call on you. So let's open up if you have any questions. Okay, so Cynthia asks, so why can the deadline be until 11.59 p.m. if you cannot submit in a day? Sorry. Sure. So, and, and Linda, am I still sharing my screen or not? Your screen is still up. Okay. I'm, I want to not share anymore. I'm not sure. Go at the top and hit stop sharing at the top. Okay. Okay. Alan, put the uh, PowerPoint back up. Thank you. So uh, Cynthia raised a good question. Why can't the deadline be 11.59 p.m. if you submit on that day and it takes a day to get the box screen, um, secure box screen up to receive the additional documents? Sure, the expectation will be that you plan if you if your organization chooses to wait until the last minute, then um, my advice would be submit your online application that day before to ensure that there is time for you to receive a box link. And then you would have time to upload by that 5 p.m. deadline. Okay, question number two. Um, are groups encouraged to do joint application or individual application? What are the pros and cons? So in, in one instance, Don, um, there are, yes, we encourage you to do joint application if you like. It was the, the pros of that is that you probably come in with 
uh, extra or I should say more expertise in doing a particular task. And some people have already asked about that. So that, that is permissible. Um, there are no cons, they're all pros to that. So uh, that can be done. If you have a question while completing the material, who do you ask? You email, there's an email address that you can email and, and you will receive a response to your questions. Uh, any other questions? I, I'll just know, Lori, you're, you can you're still me. seeing Lori's screen. Lori, Lori, you know how to stop sharing at the top? It doesn't have to stop sharing. I've been, I'm, that's what I'm trying to. I've never used Zoom for a presentation before. Sorry, I don't. I, I don't see stop sharing. It's not at the top of my screen. Can Alan? Is he able to stop it for me? And thank you, Jonathan. I'm trying to. <laughs> Hold on a second. Oh, Let's... it's this down here. Hold on. Let me see. Stop share. Okay. Yeah, I got it. it. This is this is the uh, email address that you should email if you have any questions. Uh, Barbara, Celia, Celia, yeah, yeah, Celia, Barbara. Yeah. Um, could you put back up the um, the different tiers where you have the funding? So I wanted to raise a question about that. The funding screen, Alan, is near the beginning. Okay, so when I look at this, um, this grant period is an somewhat extended across two fiscal years. So like tier one, that is the amount for that entire period. Yeah, that's, and that's, the same. Mm -hmm. that's for the first period. It's up to that amount for the first period. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the period that ends September 30th, 2023. Exactly. Okay. It's the last quarter of this fiscal year because we're starting June. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, LaDawn, Miss Love, your hand is up. You got to unmute yes, yourself. Yes, yes. So the question I had was when I'm thinking, how many, is there a particular goal for the number of people that should be reached looking at online and digital? Um, is there a particular number for the grassroots outreach on the ground? And then is there a particular number of events that should be held to, to share the subject matter for the tier three? I'm just wondering if there's some num numerical goals. Um, Lori, if I'm not correct, there's not a numerical goal on the number of events that you want to do, but it's certainly whatever you decide it has to fall within the budget that you're allocated. Uh, in terms of the number of people to reach, it depends on the target population that you indicate that you have a relationship with and that you can and that you will be able to reach. So in the grant application, there's a line that specifically asks you which of the target population do you think that you can reach and an estimate of the number of people in that population and how the resource for, for those for how you reach that number. That's indicated in the in the application process. Does that answer your question? LaDon? Oh, I used a little emoji, but yes. You say thumbs you. up. Right. <laughs> you say thumbs oh, up. Right. Oh, thank you. Jeffrey? Jeffrey Credit. Jeff Credit. Okay, so LaDon asked one of my questions. Thank you very much, LaDon. Um, my second one is, um, and I think somebody may have mentioned this also. Can we can we partner with other organizations? Yes, the answer is yes. Okay, and if there's any kind of fee, we'll we go ahead and and pay them from the grant award. Right. That's that's okay. your choice to select. You know, a partnership with another organization, but you are the the main uh, person on that particular grant, and so the grant will be issued in your organization's name, not in the partner. Okay, and will the award amounts be the same for um, this fiscal year and next fiscal year? The award amount for, I think, go back, um, Alan, on the earlier screen, it talks about the award grant. It's what the board, the HBX board has approved 
we will always go in and fight for additional funding if needed. But um, those that's what has been approved just recently. Oh, go back. Yeah. It's 400. No. Okay, so so the, the, so these numbers could be higher next year or lower. It could it could year. be higher. It could be mm -hmm. higher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All these are board, yeah, because all this is board approved. We don't we can't, we right we don't right have, yeah, it sounds right. like public private Thank partnership. So we we have to go to approve all this stuff, and we went to them to get approval to get us this far. So we have okay. no no problem fighting to get us the rest of the way. So. I'm confident. Thank you. We have what we need. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other questions? Anything else we can do for you to help you in this process? Say yes to our grant application. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the grant I agree with <laughs> grant application will be up uh, after this meeting. Certainly, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Lori Wilkerson will be managing this program for us, and she will be responding to your request. Any questions you have, there's a deadline for questions, and that and, and that's in your in the uh, deadline, uh, the list of important dates. And then we will also enter your questions on the website with the answers as well. So other people can have um, the same information that you receive. So you will get that um, on the website. And yes, we will make available this, this live presentation as well as the recording uh, before close of business today to each of you. And it will also be posted on the website. Any comments? Anything we can do better for you? This is a good group. <laughs> thank you. Quiet this, group thank here. You. <laughs> well, it's a uh, lot of information to process, so <laughs> our wheels are turning at this point when we're quiet. Yeah, I, I want to thank the advisory council for their input. I I did speak with a number of you. Thank you for uh, assisting us in quickly putting up this program. As you very well know, we just started this. And, and, and we're able to move it forward as quickly as possible so it can operate this year. So I thank you for all of your help in that regard. If there are no more questions, um, we will end this uh, conference. And uh, again, thank each of you for joining. Please take down this email address if you have any questions. And of course you will have my question and my my able uh, advisory council president, chairperson, Kathy, she's always going to let me know whatever else you need to know. So I thank you uh, so much for that. We Kathy shall end. Rock. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a good, thank you. good day. Thank you. Okay, Linda, I'm on. I'm sorry. I was multitasking. I was listening. Yeah, though. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, we want to hear from our council president. Any closing remarks from you, Kathy? Um, yes, thank uh, thank you all, and thank um, uh, you guys at DC HealthLink for just um, really being cognizant enough to know that this is going to require an all hands on deck and on ground approach um, from our trusted partners out in the community. And so we're looking really forward to this being a successful, um, hard launch, and that we can get. Uh, more folks signed up and we don't have to worry about uh, losing any funds around this important initiative. Um, so we wanna make sure we use every dollar. So get everybody signed up. That's right. Amen. All right. Cause we'll never get this money again. So this is everybody right. on here as an advocate. So we gotta make sure that we are making sure that every person in the district is signed up. All right, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Linda, I had a question. Um, I know it's a lot of people already left. I just wanted was considering. Um, did you did you guys ever get a uh, a chance to ponder in regards to uh, some of the um, family child care teachers that technically have Medicare but they still have out of pocket expenses? Have they reached out to that? I met. Um, had any answers to that as of yet? 
Jen, you, did you understand that question? Yes, and you're right. You're absolutely right. You asked us this question before. Um, I was scheduled to talk to Mila about it. Um, and so we still owe you an answer. Okay. We'll There's an interaction between Medicare and private insurance that I, I, I think we, it, it's, we've got to figure this out. Yeah, because they had they really do. Because like even with my dad, you know, I still pay out of pocket for some medications, and it is crazy. <laughs> I just I just wanted to know for some of those that do need that, so to see what they can do, or do they have to get a smaller version or something? I don't know, but um, hopefully you guys can resolve that because I look forward to partnering with you. Great, we will work on that, and we promise we will get back to you. You know what we're dealing with right now, but right. <laughs> once we get through that little challenge, we will, uh, uh, Mila will be able to respond. We'll, you know, get a response. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. All right. Thank you guys so much. Right. I Thank appreciate you. 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 All right. Okay. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Mm, is Sia, is Sia still on? Oh, there's Sia. Yeah. She's okay. Still. So, because this is, oh, did Jennifer leave? Jennifer is gone. Okay, because we had another question, and I know Sia is the expert. And maybe she can weigh in on this. But last time we had a we had a director's meeting, and Jen came in, uh, pre um, presented to the directors. And one of the things that is a concern for us is that those teachers in Maryland, and as you know, this is a no boundary city. Folks come into DC right. to work from Virginia. We have folks who come all the way from Delaware to work sometimes into right. the district. And if their employer does not participate and they are not a resident of DC, they are ineligible, correct? Right. Well, uh, Jen, can you answer that question? I think she's gone. Okay. So I, if, I, if I understand your question, if a if a provider does not offer insurance mm -hmm. and they are not residents of the District of Columbia, right? We we don't offer them insurance. We you know we can't bring them on our individual market. Right. The only way for them to come through is through the small group market. Right. But I right, and that's mm -hmm. what Jen explained. However, right. the concern I guess my concern is as an advocate, and uh -huh. because we do have some folks that are going to fall into that category, right? that the pay equity fund was intended for all educators if they lived in the district or they or they didn't live in the district right so they're able to receive you know the stipends the payments and this that any other thing that city council intended however they are not allowed to have the coverage if they fall into that category of being not being a district resident and the program that they work for is not participating. Is it any possible way that these folks would be able, and I realize that there are policies and laws that govern how insurance um, is issued, you know, as this being DC dollars. However, some of the dollars that you all are receiving for the insurance are pay equity dollars. So I'm just trying to figure out how can we get those folks covered? Yeah, I think uh, that's that's a meal question. We need to talk to her about that. Um, I'm not quite sure how that can be done. I don't know, and Pervy, but Pervy is out as well. She had a family mm -hmm. emergency. Um, but I will try to get you an answer to that question. I'm just not quite sure given um, where the, the funding of this comes from. It's we, we the DC Health Link Benefit Exchange Authority is not government funded. We're funded right. through investment to the carriers. So that's not the money that's that's being used for this program. The money that's being used for this program is government money. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, but what we're using to fund this program that we, you know, this grant program, of course, is carrier is carrier funds. So I, I just got I just don't know the answer to that. But I will um I will talk with Mila about that <clears throat> as soon as she can break herself away from this from the other crisis we're dealing with uh, to find an answer for you. I just don't know. I just don't and, know. and this may be um, in an in instance where there might have to be some person who's a real trusted voice going in, speaking with the business owner, you know, or the director about this, because I think on 
what day was that? Friday, when we had all of the uh, membership associations together and some others, I found that there are directors who still don't quite understand how this program operates. They don't understand that it's for all of their, that was the major piece, with all of their employees. Uh -huh. Some people still think it really is just for teachers mm -hmm. and, and the program, but but that I mean, the way the marketing continues and and all of the groups who are going to be engaged need to understand these nuances because it's going to be critical to get people to participate because you understand a little bit more and to hear what people are saying. Sometimes people say something, but that's not quite quite it. So I'm thinking that this issue that Kathy is raising, you know, I'm hoping we won't have a lot of people like that. But when we do, you know, then we have to look at, so what is it that, what are the strategies we can use? You know, I'm always willing to go and talk to directors. <laughs> yeah. Because, we, uh, we seen, and you're right, yeah. we haven't seen a lot of that, but there are some folks who are falling into this category. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And it, and is, it is, it is a challence. Um, well, we so some it's, it's, yeah, it's a it's a it's an excellent question. We just got to get you the right answer, okay. and we just don't have that answer today. But we we will try to get the answer to that question, and um, yeah. and 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 we just need to find out exactly what parameters uh, that are placed around the, the actual dollars that's coming into this uh, particular program, and understand what that means. And so it may it may uh, take us a minute to get back to the to find out that but we will find out just give us give us okay. a, a week or so we'll try to get the answer I, uh, linda I, I think i do know the answer to that question and i think it's a matter of federal law um we law. are we we aren't we aren't allowed to enroll non-dc residents through our individual marketplace even if it's being funded through local dollars right and so, so that's why the Mila was looking into what possibly could be done. I, I do know that she she uh, understood your question from before. She just uh, right now is not able to to give it, but we'll try to get that answer. But Jonathan is right. We do know that federally how this is um, promulgated and how we must do. But I, I do know that she understands your concern and is trying to figure out a way if we can do mm -hmm. it, how we can do it. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's why, again, that's why it's going to be so critical to be able to try to get the, the business owners, the directors, mm -hmm. uh, and because it, because some of them may not realize that, you know, you, here's an opportunity to lose an employee. Yeah. So, because if they can't, you know, they can't get insurance. But, you know, I, well, anyway, we'll, we'll come up with some strategies yeah. to we'll yeah, try to help them people see I, if i may that's uh you know i i go out on a on a regular basis to meet with uh, facility directors and yes mm -hmm. you know oftentimes um you know particularly if if uh you know, some of their employees are not uh dc residents but they're taken care of i mean the the facility directors taking care of it takes even more to persuade them to go in through through a shop the the, the shop uh, avenue where the uh the the facility is uh, is enrolled in uh, uh, in health coverage. Uh, they you know they mm -hmm. complain about uh, the administrative burden uh, and mm -hmm. uh, things of that sort. So uh, and and sometimes you know they feel also like this is not <laughs> you know if if they're if they're doing if they're covered and uh, some of their you know and, and most of their other uh, of their employees are covered, you know it 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 really takes a lot to persuade them to go in to uh, uh, to provide that health coverage for one or two people. Just Right. That's, that's the reality. And I think the reality is that we do have to look at the administrative burden. That is, is a challenge. You know, some of these programs are really, they are real small businesses, <laughs> yet they have more employees than, say, you know, maybe a one or two person place. But they have, regardless of the number at that site, they have the responsibilities for all the various functions. So mm -hmm. that may be something, you know, Kathy, that we, one, some of these things are going to be a case by case. And so maybe there's going to be a little 
problem solving action team yes. when these issues arise um that we have a way to come together you know maybe it's three people and and look at what what's the real issue here what are the options and opportunities and in some instances we're not going to be able to do it for the right. uh, for the others but i think the more people can the more directors administrators can understand that this program is to benefit all them and their employees all employees not just teachers Got it. um that that's going to be very very important and so and that also has implications for the materials prepared by the uh the exchange also yeah no the simple solution would be to be able to enroll uh non-dc residents uh through the ivl and family uh the coverage, uh, but if that's is, is if Jonathan Thess, that's uh, that's impossible because of federal regulations. Then you know, then we'll see how to how something can be carved out. I don't know, but if not, then you know the only the only route is yes, having the uh, convincing the facility director to enroll the uh, the facility at this point. Right. Well, we will work on it and get an answer to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say, I I appreciate Antonio, uh, you being out and on the ground, because I have heard you definitely been out and visiting <laughs> folks. Definitely been hearing about you, Antonio. <laughs> I don't know, good or bad, Kathy, I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 good and bad, because some folks, I think you've surprised them. I don't know. Uh, yeah. when, when you've come, yeah. uh, I just, you know, someone just yeah. said, Somebody, Antonio just left, but I didn't know they were coming, and they thought you were a scammer. So oh, yeah. <laughs> sometimes they don't let me in the door, you know. Right, exactly. Okay. <laughs> so yes, and you can understand in this day and time that sure, that is, course. you know, and 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 some of our um um uh, home educators are you know older, and they are very leery of folks you know popping up. Yep. So um yes. So just keep just keep that in mind. That uh, and I know you're calling. I know you're emailing and not answering. So you're like, I'm gonna, you know, pop up. Um, it. But it's uh, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's not a last resort by by any means, Kathy, because we found yeah. that actually being there in person works very well in persuading them to uh, to move forward. Right. Uh, and sometimes it's the only thing that persuades them to move forward. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Yes, I know you don't have an easy job, so I appreciate I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate your efforts in trying to reach you know all of our um, our home educators and I mean you know programs I should say. So well, thank you, I, I appreciate. And if there's that. anything, also too, if there's mm -hmm. anything that uh, we can do, um, sometimes Absolutely. a call a call from someone that they know to say, hey, mm -hmm. Antonio is on his way. He wants to speak to you on Saturday yeah. or Wednesday. That would also be helpful um, to get it from either, you know, me, Cynthia, Sia, someone who they know already. Mm -hmm. um, we're willing to do that as well. Well, thank you. Absolutely. Great. That's, that's terrific. Thank you. That's helpful. That's very helpful. Okay. Yeah. And, it, and if you're in talking with people and they raise things, I um, mean, you, Antonio and other others who may be going out, keeping that together. And so when we could have a call advisory committee meeting, because sometimes you may, they, you say something and they hear something different. And sometimes you say something and uh, sometimes when they say something, you hear something different. So, you know, and, and we're pioneering here uh, for the country, for the country. People around the country are really looking at this. And so looking, so, you know, being able to document kind of how we address some of these key issues that, that, that seem minor, but it, that is going to be very important. And, and maybe, I don't know if that's a part of the FAQ uh, that you're doing or, but, but we do need to, when these issues come up, be able to document and say, this is a resolution so that everybody can understand. Well, thank you all.